epilogue, showing how Renard, one evening in the forest, dubbed his three sons Knights of the Order of Renard. This way, this way, Rover. Lanfert, the forest keeper, who was hammering stakes into the ground to mark out the site for a state clearance scheme, listened and smiled. Dusk was falling. He picked up his hammer from the grass, replaced his uniform cap on his head, slung the strap of his haversack over his shoulder, and went on to the forest path. As he walked, he hummed to himself the old hunting song that his forefathers had sung. It's Renard the fox, his cunning so good, let's chase him into the depths of the wood. He knew the red fox with the black tufted tail. Renard was calling to his mate or his sons to go hunting. Lanfert thought of him with an obscure, profound and warm friendship, which he could not dissociate in any way from his love of the forest, the copse in spring and the glade in autumn, the herd of deer leaping across a path, the woodpecker with his loud cry, and the robin in winter hopping over the frozen leaves. It was mid-September. The golden light of evening fell on the toad flax beside the path, the branches leaning down overhead and the edge of the forest opening onto the fields of the plain which Lanfert was already approaching. Then, his rough heart filled with the same deep emotion that the fox's bark had awakened in him just previously. He did not define it further, but yielded to it with delight. It came from somewhere beyond himself, from a legendary past which had brought to life again this evening a long succession of Lanferts who all had the same figure, the same cheerful, lively gaiety. Below a little stone bridge, with flowers hanging down from its arch, someone, Daisy perhaps, was finishing her washing late, beating it loudly and rhythmically. The bell in the little church, swinging over its small open platform, rang out the notes of the Angelus. The tiled roof showed pink through the old elder trees. Against the presbytery wall flowered the last dark red roses of the season. The forester went forward over the plain, listening to the beating of the washing, the notes of the Angelus, and the creaking wheels of a truck along the road. This evening these human, familiar sounds contributed to his happiness, but he was still listening for the alert and piercing bark which had caught his ear in the dell where he had been working. He heard it and smiled again. If this wild, eager voice had remained silent, something would have been lacking from his enjoyment of the moment. Good hunting, Renard, he thought, for you and your litter. The shadows were lengthening over the plain. The tits were chirping in the hedges. In a blue and yellow whirlwind, they flew away towards the forest trees, awaking the noisy chatter of the magpies and the jays, who were already perching in the branches. From the depths of the coverts, a cock pheasant uttered his hoarse cry twice over. "'Silence, piercer!' said Renard. He growled, showing his teeth, for piercer had almost leapt forward. The big fox cub lay down flat, and he too curled back his lips, uttering a low growl. Renard looked at Ermeline, and she knew, by his look alone, that Renard was not displeased by their son's anger. Piercer was already acquiring his father's size and weight, but his lines were not so fine. The outline of his muscles barely showed, and his coat was still uneven. Above them, the glade of horn beans extended its veil of leaves. They were standing at the edge of the bramble thicket, a few feet from Malpass, its entrance hidden from all eyes by the tangle of thorny branches. Renard was listening. The sounds from the plain had died away. In the half-light of the undergrowth, damp and blue with evening shadows, the little owls were beginning to fly. The fox pricked up his ears. In the distance, the sharp cry rang out again, shriller and exultant with a sudden ardour. "'Rover has found Gouterot!' said Renard to Ermeline. Then, more firmly, he said to Piercer, "'Find your place!' and stay on the lookout. The young fox raised his head, his eyes watching his father's eyes, his black quivering nose and his pricked ears that moved from side to side. Then Piercer sniffed and listened himself. His tawny eyes shone with intelligent excitement. He hesitated imperceptibly, then set out in a smooth trot through the undergrowth. 
Renard and his mate allowed him to gain a little distance, and then, going along side by side, they followed him, keeping him in sight. Piercer had stopped where two paths crossed, one of them broad and apparently disused, overgrown with grass and moss, the other a winding path with a surface so smooth that it seemed to have been swept. "'That's not bad,' said Renard as he came up. "'But come here, three paces to this side, behind that tuft which hides you completely, and in this gap which lets the starlight through. You'll see the quarry coming more easily, and you'll jump with more assurance. We'll see you later, son. Don't forget that tonight is your night.' With Ermelin still at his side, he went into the covert, and the two silent shapes disappeared at once. The chase went on, turning and twisting. Ermelin and Renard lay down under a holly bush, invisible to others, but watching Piercer and following the nocturnal chase by ear, their heart beating, but a little concerned, although cheerfully so. "'Trickster has picked up the scent!' said Renard. "'He's found it. He's leading!' He'll head it back, I'll wager, and on his own. He was pleased. He made his usual gesture, placing his paw on Ermeline's neck and bending her head over slightly. A long-eared shadow, silent like them, glided towards them as though born of the darkness. It was Rover, their favourite, the smallest and slightest of their sons, possessing an infallible nose and as skilful as his two parents together. The stars moved round in the sky. Sudden gusts of wind passed, making the dried heather flowers crackle. From time to time, at the edge of the shadows, a harsh light cut through the darkness, came closer, and turned the corner of the road with majestic slowness. The headlights of the car shone like two enormous eyes, and for a long time, from the trees to the sky, the hissing of the tyres could be heard on the Tarmacadam road. The three foxes remained motionless, starting only when they heard cries or the sound of feet skirting the enclosure, so close sometimes that they seemed to feel the dead leaves thrown up by the hare's thudding feet rustle against their very sides. Once more the chase changed its direction, and this time all three foxes, obeying the same instinct, rose to their feet and strained towards the darkness. Trickster had suddenly swerved, narrowing the circle of the chase, where the pathways curved round, they could see Pierce's leap of attack, magnificently firm and sure, and Gutero yelped at once. Piercer had caught hold of him well, full in the back, but the hare fought savagely between his jaws. He stiffened his back, then let it go limp, thrusting his long legs down to the ground with the same violence. Like Piercer, he could hear Trickster barking as he came closer. He shook himself violently, making Piercer stumble. Then he shook himself again, and his skin split open. The young fox's teeth had been jarred twice, and they now slid into the soft fur. Gutero escaped, just as Trickster rushed up. The two brothers growled, hurled themselves at each other, and rolled over on the old pathway. "'Leave them alone, Ermelin, said Renard. She obeyed, and let them fight. Renard did not look at them any longer. "'Your turn again, Rover,' he said. Rover sniffed at the grass and the wind, then he plunged into the darkness. Then, a moment later, Renard said, "'Your turn now, trickster.' With drooping tails and bristling fur, the fox cubs had stopped fighting and separated. Trickster bared his teeth for the last time, sniffed the grass too, and disappeared at the exact spot where Rover had just plunged into the night. "'Your turn now, Piercer,' said Renard. "'Stay here, for Trickster will drive Gutero this way again.' Renard and his mate went back beneath the holly bush. The forest was quite silent, and through the silence, far away, a cry rang out, shrill and clear, which made their hearts beat again. "'Rover has picked up the scent again,' said Renard. Silence fell once more, complete and apparently endless. Then, from the very heart of this silence, louder and more eager than ever, the cry rang out again with a double bark. "'Now Trickster is leading!' said Renard. He sighed deeply and laid his paw on Ermelin's neck, 
with the same authoritative, affectionate gesture, and it was she who spoke on his behalf with happiness and pride. And this time, Piercer won't let go.